Hello guys and welcome back to Drawing Fundamentals and we are starting season 2 with a bang! I know you guys have been itching to start to shape your drawings and after today's lesson, tell you what, you can start to shape your drawings finally! The issue with just line work is that it is unable to portray certain things about your drawing. Uh, for example, form will further enhance and show the three-dimensionality uh, of your drawings. And of course, shading can also introduce mood to your drawings. Like this. Now, why don't we continue with the lesson? <laughs> Before you learn how to shade, you have to first understand where to put your shading strokes. To understand where to put your shading strokes, you have to first learn about the form principle. The form principle is the analysis of nature in terms of geometrical solids, which can then be rendered according to laws of tonal contrast. Understanding how forms behave in different light conditions can help you achieve added realism in your work. We need to first learn about the different terminologies with regards to the form principle. And you must be wondering why, why do I need to learn all this, you know, uh, terminologies. What's the point of doing that? I'm just here to learn how to shade, how to draw. Well, in future, when you are dealing with clients, when you are, when you have an art director that's uh, giving you uh, feedback on your artwork, he or she may say something like, oh, can you increase the intensity of the cast shadow? And if you do not know the terminologies, you may go and tweak the core shadow uh, and produce something that he or she might not want. So it's important to actually uh, learn these terminologies and actually memorize them by heart. Uh, it's not a lot of uh, terms. So anyway, let's get started. I'll first create a sphere over here. I'll use this diagram to kind of show you the different terminologies, right? Um, this sphere has a default value, right? It's, it is, where do I see it? It is 59% bright. So it has this gray value over here. And this is the kind of default or inherent value that this object, this circular shape has. Any color out there, unless it's pure white or pure black, has some kind of value, right? Um, every color has its own inherent value. So if you take for instance, A yellow color. Let me just draw that out on the screen. We use a better brush like this one. A yellow color like this and a purple color like this. These are all colors and maybe I'll just go just do another one. Let's say the green color. Something like that. They all have their own inherent values. When I convert this image into a grayscale image, their values would be different. So let me just do that real quick over here. Set it saturation. You'll notice that the inherent value for yellow is a lighter shade of gray as compared to green and the darkest would be purple. So it's something for you to take note. Anyway, I'm I'm kind of jumping the gun, so let me just dial it back uh, to this. So we have this gray circle over here, and what's the what's the easiest way to make this look three dimensional? It's add shadows, right? But before we do that, before we do that, before I I forget, the inherent value is 
sometimes uh, also known as half tone. All right. So that's the the very first terminology, the the default, the default um value is known as half tone. So next we will introduce a shadow so that uh the 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 ball looks a bit more uh, three dimensional, right? So let me just brush a shadow over here, something like that. Uh, I'll say this is this is this is okay. Um, so this shadow is what we call a core shadow. Core shadow over here. So this is called a core shadow. But if you observe, if you observe an object when it's being lit. Uh, there will also be a part that becomes uh, brighter, right? So let's create another layer. Let's select this grey and choose a lighter colour and just make this part a little bit brighter. So this, this part uh, that is under the influence of a light source, let me just very quickly indicate in the light source so you we, we kind of want the a very bad cone we kind of want the light source to be coming from here so this part is called the area in which the the surface is being affected by the light it's called the center light Thing. UK UK uh, spelling over here, center light. So we have the the center light. We have the half tone and we have the core shadow, right? So what's the next thing that we will add? So assuming that this this object that we have over here in the sphere, which it is, um, you would notice something like this. Let me just uh. Use a red color over here. Assuming that this light is coming from here and it's kind of shining like this. Something like this. So like the light is kind of uh shining like that. It's a little bit of a uh, physics involved you definitely will get the brightest part over here the area where it's closest to the to the light source and it kind of fades until a certain point if i can draw the uh, cross contour of this of this um, of this sphere until a certain point where this side of the sphere is actually not facing the light so to put it in simpler terms, this this area over here is actually facing facing the light source, so it's receiving light. But this side of the sphere is actually not receiving any any sort of light, right? So therefore, and therefore, you you get the shadow over here. However, uh, usually, right, the objects do not work in isolation. So meaning to say, um, typically, unless the object is 100% not reflective at all. It will still be affected by uh, light sources from around the environment or even bounce light. So assuming that the sphere right, is actually sitting on a surface on a table, this part of the, the sphere is actually getting what we call bounce light. So the, the light is shining on the table over here and the table is reflecting off the, the light like this. So some people call it reflected light, some people call it bounce light. It's basically the same the same thing. So what you want to do, right, typically, is to make sure that there is some form of reflected light over here. So to do so, I would actually sure that I'm using a soft brush I 
I will actually make this part slightly lighter. This area that is closer to the to the table be slightly lighter, something like this. But do take note that uh, no matter how reflective this this um table is, right? Unless this this sphere itself is super reflective, it's like a glass. No, a glass is a is a terrible example. Unless it's a, like a metallic ball, the reflected light should never be as light as the half tone. You should see a shadow appearing somewhere here, right? So this is, uh, if you ask a a child to define shadow, most likely the, the, the child would say something like this, the shadow that's casted on the floor. Alright, so this shadow is known as cast shadow. Okay, it's casting on, on the other surface. It can be a table, it can be uh, another object that's nearby. So it's a cast shadow. Let me just erase this and create another so like this. And just give the color something like that. So this is the cast shadow. Maybe I lower the intensity of that. Okay, perfect. So this is the car shadow, there's some reflected light from the table. The next thing that we want to know is, or we want to learn, is what we call the ambient occlusion. So the occlusion shadow appears when um, two objects are in very close contact. So something like this. So on the human body, right, uh, occlusion Shadows can typically be, be found uh, under the under the the chin in the armpits uh, because these are areas where usually light will not be able to reach. So going back to the cast shadow that we have over here, let me insert in some occlusion shadows. Okay, next we want to uh, learn about the Terminator. Not the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, but the Terminator that we use in form theory. Okay, so let me explain why the Terminator happens. So typically the Terminator is located along the along the plane break of any any surface. So for this sphere, the plane break can be uh, identified as over here. So, so basically, a uh, plane break is okay. Imagine this, this sphere instead of being like perfectly round, right? It's kind of like this, uh, faceted, faceted sphere like this. Kind of in your like in your in your three D modeling software, right? You you create a sphere, but it's uh, a lot more low polygon. It looks kind of something like this. So if you were to shade this low polygon sphere, right, this part will be the brightest, and then it slowly becomes dark, lah, right? And then over here you have some reflected light and stuff. So why the terminator is located here, right? Is because this is the part where it receives the least amount of light. Because over here on this side, you you get planes that are facing facing more more towards the the light, and it's receiving some sort of light. And then over on this side, right, it's getting the bounce or the reflected light from the surface from the the table. So this is the point where it it the the plane kind of breaks. To, to face this side as opposed to facing this side. So you, you get something like this. Later I'll show you an example with cylinders and cones and, and where to locate the plane break and, and the terminator. 
So, uh, going by this, let me just uh, hide this to make this clearer. So you want the Terminator to be over here. So basically... Oops. You want to use a darker color in the middle here. Okay, maybe I made the core shadow to be a bit too dark, so let me just lower the intensity so that the, the terminator becomes a bit more prominent. Okay, something like that. I think it's good. And maybe I should lower the reflected light as well, make it darker. So you can still see the reflected light, it's just that it's, uh, it's not so obvious. Okay, so uh, I hope that you can see over here. Let me just further dial it down a little bit. Yep, something like that. And maybe I lower the occlusion shadow a little bit as well. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so as you can see, uh, over here we have a, a band of uh, values that are significantly darker than the, the, the core shadow. And this is what we call the Terminator. Uh, last but not least, we have what we call the highlight. So a lot of people always uh, mistake highlight with center light. So what exactly is highlight? Highlight is the, the the point of the surface where the light is actually re reflecting directly, is bouncing from the um on the surface and reflecting reflecting that light directly into your eye. Okay, so let me just quickly indicate the using the wrong tone. Uh yes. Even lighter. So something like that. Right. Okay, something like that. So if you can look at the diagram uh, that I'm inserting in, in post-production, uh, you can see how the light source is kind of a, like a physics diagram of how the light source uh, gets bounced from the object into your eyes. And this highlight is really dependent on the the reflectivity, the specularity of the object itself. Uh, and this one is a little bit a little bit advanced to get into, but in general, in general, I just want you to remember that highlight informs us of the material properties of that object, whereas shadows would inform us about the form. It will inform us whether this this object is three dimensional. When you know what what are the what are the, what are the how does this object look like in cross contour? Just as a recap, we start off with a two dimensional circle with a with a default half tone. All right, this is the inherent value of the object. Next, we added in a core shadow. This is the side in which the object is facing away from the light source. So it's called the core shadow. Next up, we identify where, where is the side that is facing the light and that side will be receiving more light uh, the closer it is towards the, towards the light source. So this area is known as center light. Next up, because uh, this unless this this sphere is uh, floating in space, it will be receiving some sort of bounce light or reflected light uh, from the 
surrounding from the surface that the sphere is sitting on, that is resting on, it will re receive some form of reflected light. Like this. Let me just try to brighten this part up so that it's a bit more obvious on the screen capture. Just take note that the reflected light should never be as bright or brighter than the half tone. Okay, next up, uh, when we have an object sitting on another surface, this object itself will cast a shadow. Will cast a shadow. Uh, let me just. Will cast a shadow on the surface that is resting on, and therefore we get the cast shadow over here. Cast shadow. Next, the area where the object is resting on one another, right, is uh, it doesn't allow any sort of light to enter. When when two objects are too close to one another, um, that is where there is an absence of light. So this area should be even darker, like for example over here and here. This is known as occlusion shadow. Next, we identify that uh, there's a band over here in the center that receives the least amount of light because of how the how the how the object is uh, modeled in in three D space, right? So uh, over here we would darken this this transitional area, and this darkening of the shadow is called the terminator. Lastly, the area where the light is reflected off the surface and directly into your eyes or the viewer's eyes is known as highlight. The sharpness and the uh the brightness of the highlight is dependent on the material property. So if let's say you have a more dull surface kind of like a um what's an example like a wood wood surface it will not have such a clear highlight so a wood surface will the highlight will more or less look something like this it's very, it's very dull or you can't even see it at all it, it really depends but if you are dealing with a metallic surface uh you will most likely see a highlight that looks kind of like this The metallic surface will kind of have a highlight like like this, so it's a uh, a lot a lot more clearer. In this next diagram, you can see how the form principle can be applied to the four basic forms: the sphere, cylinder, cube, and the cone. Alright, before we begin uh, to learn how to shape, let me introduce you to some of the tools that you need for this particular lesson. Of course, the first thing you need is the pencil, right? And as you can see, I have prepared my pencil uh, by sharpening it in a way that is perhaps a little bit different from what you are used to. Uh, I'm using a pen knife. Uh, like this to sharpen and later I'll go through how to uh, prepare your pencil to make it look something like this. Um, besides the pencil, the traditional pencil and the sharpener, oh one more thing that I forgot to mention, uh, it will be ideal if you have a wide range of pencils uh, ranging from maybe HB all the way to 8 or 9B. Uh, this is so that you can produce the range of values that you need for your drawings. Uh, however, um, given the current situation, uh, if you have at least a 2E pencil, I think that's sufficient. Ideally, for me personally, I, I like to use 4, somewhere between 4B, 5B, or uh, 6B, uh, as uh, in my opinion, it, it, it can produce the range of values that I will need. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I don't have that 
luxury right now, but I'm using currently using a 5B pencil. Besides the normal graphite or lead pencil, I would recommend if you have uh, to um, use a mechanical pencil as well. Uh, this is very handy for really, really fine details uh, that you want to touch up upon. So a mechanic pencil is good. Uh, lastly, uh, would be the eraser. So ideally, you want to use a needable eraser. But once again, given the current situation, if you only have a uh, traditional eraser, it's fine. Uh, if you can, you should also be using the pen knife to, to cut the eraser to form something like this. This will be very helpful uh, when you are trying to erase very intricate parts of your drawing and you don't want to like accidentally smear the entire drawing, uh, cutting the the eraser to form a shape like this is very handy. You can uh, use the pointed uh, sharp edge over here and just erase a small part, a small chunk of the drawing. Okay, next up, I will show you how to sharpen the pencil using a pen knife. So first thing first, um, when handling the pen knife, just be very, very careful. Uh, it's a dangerous object. In fact, don't bring it to school. Uh, once school reopens because it's deemed a, a weapon. So just use it at home, sharpen your pencils before you come for class. So over here I'm using a rather large, uh, rather large pen knife, um, but you can use any, any normal pen knife, it's fine. Um, but I find that these are really good because they have this, uh, metal protective casing over here that prevents you from cutting your own finger. So what you want to do uh, when sharpening your pencil is to not like wildly just fling your, your hand like this. Uh, not only is this very uncontrolled, uh, it, it also poses um, as a potential hazard for people around you. You might accidentally just uh, while shaving your, your pencil, right, just cut someone. So please don't do that. All right. Uh, what you want to do is you want to angle the blade such that the pointed end, the the sharp end, is actually uh on the on the lead, the the pencil itself. And what you want to do is actually use your thumb to just gently guide the pen knife along. All right. You you are using a pushing action, right? Instead of uh of uh you know you are using your 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 bicep and your arm to swing it. You are using your thumb to push the pen knife forward. And while you're doing it, you are shaving chunks of your pencil. So this is a very controlled kind of movement. All right. So what you want to do is just gently, you know, push. So be careful when you are near the the lead area, you don't want to, you know, uh, waste lead by accidentally cutting parts of it off. So the idea is to expose as much lead as possible so that you have a wider range of, of uh, shading later on as compared to like just something like this. You can cover a, a, a bigger ground. And this is very useful when you are applying like lighter strokes, uh, you are darkening the background, so on and so forth. Okay, one of the common mistakes for beginners when it comes to shading is that they tend to make their, their drawings either too light or too dark. So one warm-up exercise that you can do to kind of familiarize yourself with the tool that you are using uh, would be this. Alright, just draw a rectangular shape on the paper. Doesn't have to be super accurate. Just a rectangular shape. It's fine. Try to uh, keep it fairly long. Like this. Hope it shows up on the, on the camera. And just darken it a little bit. Alright, the idea is that you want to uh, use your pencil to shade from light to dark. So you will start off with 
light over here and then we'll move on to the so when you are trying to shade light tones i would advise that you use the overhand grip something like that and just go very light And as you are progressing, inching towards the right hand side of the paper, just try to start to exert a little bit more pressure onto the paper. This exercise also trains you on um, controlling your strength when you are shading. So, if possible, try to keep the transition to be as seamless as possible, right? Just slowly increase your pressure as you make your way towards the right hand side of the of the paper. Don't worry if you are going out of the, the box a little bit. Okay, at a certain point, um using the overhand grip uh, it's a bit difficult to exert more pressure because you might break the break the lead so i would change into more of a tripod grip uh, for the darker tones all right so let me try to increase my strength while doing this exercise you will be surprised to see the the range of values that can be produced by just one pencil When shading, I like to use this kind of um, top right corner angle approach. Like I'm making crooks that are angling towards the, the top right corner of the page. Okay, now that I'm really close to the edge, I am more or less going all out. Alright, so to summarize, this is a in my opinion, a, a very effective uh, warm-up exercise to kind of gauge your strength and how much um, pressure you need to exert to create this uh, simple value chart over here. Alright, next up I'll show you some shading techniques that you can use for your own drawings. The first technique is called hatching and for this technique I'll be using the mechanical pencil because I just feel that it's uh, easier to show <clears throat> with the mechanical pencil. Alright, uh, let me start with hatching. So what you want to do over here um, is first, before you, you even consider any techniques, to so first identify the direction of the light source. So for all of these um, circles over here, I am using the uh, white sauce that is coming from the top right hand corner of the page all right so the the light is kind of shining like this uh, on all four of these circles or spheres all right so for hatching what you want to do is you want to um go in the same general direction right so for example what i like to do is i like to uh, go towards the the top right hand corner uh, and you are kind of um, moving according to the form, the, the volume, the contour of the form. So you don't want to be making straight lines like this, right? You don't want to be doing that. Uh, you want instead to be kind of curving around the contours of this, of this uh, sphere. So something like this. So generally when it comes to shading, right, I like to work in layers in the sense that I will go from very light to very dark. Remember all the theory that we learned just now on where to put the shadows. The downside of uh, using just hatching is that it produces this kind of hairy looking um, form. Add in a little bit of uh, occlusion shadow over here. And 
maybe clean it up with a eraser. Okay, the next approach is called cross hatching. Right, and as the name sounds, basically you are doing the same approach uh, like you did with hatching, but instead of just one direction, you are going in two directions right now. So let me just clean up this uh, sp sphere drawing. It's not very uh, accurate, but it's fine. So let us start with doing what we did earlier with hatching just one direction setting down the base tone once again making sure that we are we are mindful of the of the contour of this sphere we are not just you know applying straight lines okay um, when it comes to cross hatching, some people would advise that uh, when you are drawing, when you are applying the the secondary hatching, right, you go in kind of like a ninety degree angle to form something like this. Um, but from what my lecturer in college, uh, he he advised me um, that you shouldn't do something like this. What you want to do instead is you want to go in a direction that is not exactly 90 degrees but like something less than 90 degree but it's definitely a, a different direction so something more like this if that makes sense let me just make it more obvious so it's not this but this like the difference is very subtle but uh it, it will create a more visually pleasing kind of a uh, final image so let me try to show it over here and as i'm doing this i am once again very mindful about keeping my strokes to be curved instead of uh instead of straight The third style of shading that I will introduce to you would be scribbling. All right. So as you can see, the hatching and the cross hatching techniques, right? They are all very controlled in the sense that uh, the direction of your pencil strokes needs needs to be fairly consistent. Okay. Um, but for scribbling, the idea is that the the direction and the movement is quite random. So this is, um, I think, especially useful when you are trying to make some form of a, some form of a texture on the on the thing that you are you are shading. Okay, so something like that. It looks a little bit hairy, a little bit random. But that's the, the intent of this of this effect. Of course, there are other kind of uh, ways to shape uh, beyond just these four methods that I'm uh, introducing to you guys today. There are also so dotting that you can try, basically just uh, you know dotting on the on the page. Uh, typically, that's used for a uh, pen. Uh, but the last. The last method I wanted to show you guys is actually blending or sm uh, smudging. However, however, this is not a technique that I usually use. Okay, the reason being that I I have like extremely sweaty palms, and that's the reason I'm using this this uh tissue paper here to to prevent any sort of smudging. Um, but because of that, right, I I have never actually smudged my drawings. Um, before, so I, I I feel that I'm not um, I'm not in a position where I I can teach you the blending or smudging techniques. Of course, you can use other tools like the tissue paper, or you can use uh, smudging stubs uh, that you can purchase uh, from places like Art Friend uh, to help with your smudging. But it's just a technique that I've not been uh, experimenting with. I've not been trying for I think since I started drawing. 
simply because of my disability. Um, but what I'm going to show you instead is my my approach to shading. Okay, and it's actually a combination of like hatching, scribbling, not so much cross hatching, a little bit of the fun fundamentals of smudging. Uh, but not in the sense where you are using your fingers or external tools as much, but not, more of a uh, gradation of, of tones. And you can't see the the pencil strokes. Uh, that's the, the, the technique. I, I'm not sure what's the name of, like whether there's a specific name to it. So I'll just call it the Jason technique. Uh, that There might be a spe special name for it, but I'll just leave it as it is. For now, if you ask me, how I usually render my images. Uh, for one thing, it's been a while since I rendered a uh, finished piece traditionally, uh, at least with with uh, pencil. I've been doing most of my work digitally. Um, but in the past, I'll be, I'm mostly using hatching and this particular technique uh, that I'll show you. So for this particular technique, it's quite similar to how I did this um, value chart over here. So what I want to do is I want to make my pencil strokes as invisible as possible. So what I how I achieve this is I would use the overhang grip to first lay in the the base the base value for the object. So right now I'm also coloring in the area that is supposed to be the highlight and center light. For this since the idea is that I will eventually try to mask out the direction of my strokes. Um, it is fine if I just do like a straight, straight line uh, when it comes to rendering. Okay, with the light direction in mind, which is coming from the top right, I'm slowly kind of increasing my pressure on the paper. On areas where I think the shadows should be forming. Okay, so once I, I reach a point where I, I think it's a bit difficult for me to uh, go any darker with the overhang grip, I will switch to the tripod grip like this. Just try to clean up my drawings using the tripod grip because it's easier to kind of make fine details with it. Right, um, and of course, last but not least, using this eraser to kind of clean up the edges. Alright, so something like that. Okay. One last thing, uh, again, using this eraser, I'm lifting up the highlight on the on the sphere might not be super obvious so lifting out a little bit of reflected light um, but for this part ideally you want to use the needable eraser because the needable eraser will not erase completely okay so something like that For your very first exercise, you are required to draw and shape the photo of the sphere on the right hand side. You may use the step by step diagram on the left hand side as a form of a guideline to reach the intended end result. 
In the second exercise, you are required to draw and render these three geometrical forms. If you want to, you can also include the cloth that is on the surface in which the three forms are resting on. For this example, I provided a drawing instead of a photo so that you can see how the artist rendered the objects and you can use that as a guideline for your own drawing. When it comes to rendering more complicated forms, it helps to be able to deconstruct and visualize these complex forms in simpler shapes. For example, when it comes to shading the human torso, we can first visualize it as a banded cylinder. And by now, you should be very familiar with shading the cylinder. Next, we can make the form slightly more complicated by deconstructing the human figure over here in the second drawing. The way we shape this drawing is very similar to how we shape the geometrical form to the left. As you can see, the location of the highlights, center light, core shadow, and terminator is very similar to where you would place it on the cylinder on the left. Finally, we move on to the actual human torso. And once again, the process is very similar. For this, you are just adding more and more forms on top of the basic form that is underneath. You can once again tell that the general location of the highlight, center light, core shadow, and terminator is the same as the cylinder on the left. Using this train of thought will ensure that the overall shading of your object is consistent within the entire scene. It is a very common mistake for students to place the location of certain elements such as the highlights at an incorrect location and therefore making the entire scene look inconsistent. Moving on to exercise 3, we will be drawing the apple. It's not quite a spherical shape but it definitely has some similarities to how you would otherwise shape a sphere. Please draw based on the photo that is provided on the right hand side, but you may use the diagrams on the left to inform you how to achieve the final intended result. The last exercise for today will be to draw based on this drawing of a pair of praying hands. Now it looks very complicated, definitely way more complex than the previous three exercises. However, if you deconstruct this hand into simpler geometrical forms, the way to render it is fairly straightforward. You should also be able to identify the direction of the light source just by looking at this reference drawing. Alright, before I end off today's lesson, I just want to highlight a somewhat intermediate topic, but I think it's important for you guys to know about this right now. And that is the concept of value schemes. Now, each color has its own inherent value, something that I mentioned before in the terminologies part of this video. Value is the brightness or darkness of a color. So a good example of this concept can be illustrated with the skin tone of different human races. So, before shading a drawing, it is wise to plan out your value schemes first. This is done by first determining where is the lightest and where is the darkest region of the drawing. Next, you want to distribute where the other areas would fall in the value scale. So for example, in this photo, if we desaturate it and look at it in only in terms of value, before we start shading based on this reference, we would have to, in our minds, determine where is the lightest and where are the darkest areas. Take note that value is relative and it can be difficult to identify areas that are very close to one another in terms of value. For example, it can be difficult to see that this area is actually darker than this area. To summarize today's video, 
we learn where to shape by understanding the form principle. We also learn how to shape through a variety of different shading techniques. Lastly, we learn about the value schemes and how to organize your lights and ducts in your drawing. From here on out, the world is your oyster. You can go out there and shade whatever drawing that you want to. However, just as a word of caution, I would like to direct you to this Proco video about the top five shading mistakes. And if I can say so myself, I would say that from my observation uh, from my students, the number one mistake that I just cannot stand is that a lot of students rush into the process of shading. And I liken this to the act of polishing a third. No matter how you polish and refine this piece of crap, it will still look like a piece of crap. So please, refine your drawings, make sure everything is proportionate before you move into the phase of shading. If not, have fun shading and I'll see you in the next video.